question. So today we're talking about, you know, what's involved in a home loan application. Yep. Um, and let's just start with talking about what types of information the banks are looking for when you apply for a loan. Definitely. So I think um, today's a good um, opportunity to break it down into very, very simple um, instructions for potential clients or potential um, buyers or even refinances out there in the market. So what we're typically looking for is identification. Yep. Yep. Income. So mm -hmm. your your um, income uh, over self-employed or PAYG, and also your living expenses. So that could be fixed living expenses um, or contracted stuff um, as well. So we break those three things down. Yep, awesome. So let's drill down further into those because we have had a few questions come through Absolutely. Um, over the last couple of weeks. So I think the first thing that you mentioned was ID. Yep. Um, now Kevin actually, asked, I mean ID is pretty straightforward, that's sort of identification. Yeah. So, you know, driver's license, passport, yep. that sort of Definitely. thing. Um, but there are some interesting situations there that are. pop up and Kevin actually asked um, a question because he has a different name on his driver's license as what is on his passport. Yep. Um, now most banks need 100 points of ID. So how do you generally deal with, you know, situations like this where, you know, it is quite common that when people migrate from overseas countries, yep. um, especially if it's a non-English speaking country that they're, they might have a name change when they definitely. get here. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, can you talk us through that situation for Kevin? Yeah, definitely. So we do, we do need um, 100 points of ID for an application. So typically, as you mentioned, Marissa, that's usually for us a, a driver's license and a passport. And in the case where a name might be different, let's say on the driver's license, and even even going to as simple as not having a middle name, for example, on the driver's license, but having it on the passport, typically what we do would be looking at a third form or a, yeah, a third form of identification as well, which yeah. might be a, a birth certificate. Um, and that, that birth certificate then would round out the uh, appropriate name and then supported by the second document, which might be then the passport. Um, it is more common than you think to yeah. have. Yeah, well, even in the case where someone's recently got married and changed, you know, uh, they might have their maiden name yeah. on, you know, on the property that they're refinancing yeah. and their married name on their, you know. Absolutely. So, so then, it is quite common even in that situation. It is. and and and. To get those ducks in a row in the application is important. So you might end up um, needing to get your marriage certificate um, sorted out, or even the, the the change of name if that is the case in a in a marriage. So um, we see it a lot, and we do try to pick it up as early as possible um, because any of these documentations outside of passport and driver's license can take time to to gather. Yeah. So um, yeah. yeah, and sometimes even you know I've seen in the past where the name of a, of a person has been spelt wrong on the title when they've purchased a property. Yep. And then to refinance that property or to sell that property at some yep. other point in time, that creates problems because maybe their conveyancer initially made a mistake. Yep. Um, so sometimes it's not only a matter of getting the identification 100% right, but you know, sometimes we need to involve a conveyancer yep. to actually get, get it all done properly. So that, that's the sort of thing that we can help you with. But I guess the main thing for you to know is just to make sure that you do have 100 points of ID and the preference being that they will match in yeah. terms of, you know, the spelling's the same, the name's the same, it's your current residential address. Yeah. And perhaps if you are thinking of a loan application in the future and your IDs don't quite match, then you should be speaking to your mortgage broker early just yeah. to find out what you will need to do. Yeah. And sometimes in the very, you know, most extreme of situations, it might actually be worth getting your driver's license updated to reflect the yeah. correct details or something along those lines. Definitely, and, and just a simple one with the driver's license. Um, you may not need to pay for a new one. You can get the sticker um, with an updated address stuck to the back and we just need to get both sides of your ID um, covered off in that, in that scenario. Yeah, so I feel like we've addressed Kevin's question Definitely. there and I feel like yep. we've covered ID. So let's move on to the next yep. one, which I think was income. Yep. Um, so obviously we've got two different types of applicants. Yep. We've got applicants that are employees yep. or pay as you go, PAYG, yep. and then we've got applicants that are self-employed. Definitely. So let's just start with PAYG employees. Yep. You know, what sort of documents do they need to produce to um, confirm their income? Definitely. So what, what we've found, especially I suppose maybe in the last few years, is that um, people are earning, even in a PAYG scenario, 
multiple types of income in their current role at work. Um, so what we're trying to understand is, first of all, what is their role? What, how are they earning their money? By yeah. obviously asking those questions. Um, and then from there to support the conversation, we're looking at a couple of pay slips yeah. to then identify um, that conversation. So their base hours and maybe some overtime um, there could be some commissions, there could be some variances in income that the client might earn. Um, to document those things, we would then ask for last year's financial statement, so a PAYG summary or a notice of assessment. That would then help us understand the earnings from last year mm. and were they consistent with what we're projecting out for the, for the new financial year. And I guess, you know, I guess our role as mortgage brokers is to yep. make sure that we're using, you know, putting the applicant in the best possible position. 100%. So making sure that we're taking as much of that income into consideration as we can to yep. make the application as strong as possible. So, you know, things like the, you know, last year's payment summary yep. and um, to reflect, you know, ongoing commissions and bonuses can be helpful in terms Definitely. of just lifting that borrower's borrowing capacity to, you know, the level that they need it to be. 100%. Yeah, we, we are looking heavily into pay slips. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are a lot of different types of uh, incomes a client can earn um, over times, um, yeah. penalty rates, uh, allowances. There's also the situation where, you know, someone's working for a not-for-profit yep. and they're salary sacrificing yep. a large portion of their income and uh, to living expenses. Yep might be salary sacrificed against the mortgage or yep. maybe against a debit you know a debit visa card that they can use definitely um so these are all things that we can sort of add back and make sure that we're getting the most yep. um you know maximizing your borrowing potential in terms of what you want to achieve definitely i think it's just putting the client's true income yeah um the best possible way like, like you mentioned the best possible way we can to the bank um, to yeah. support you know, a strong and healthy deal for yeah. the client. Yep. Okay, so that's if you're an employee, if you're PAYG, yep. but what about if you're self-employed? Obviously, you don't have pay slips if you're self-employed or you might no. be paying yourself a wage, yep. but there is another form of income verification there. So how is that yep. assessed? So, so with a self-employed um, applicant, there are, typically what we see the self-employed is they're either a sole trader, so it's just themselves um, doing the work that they do, or they may uh, have a business or a company structure um, through a family trust or, or obviously a company. So, um, but we, we wanna see the same information for both. We wanna basically get the business tax returns, profit and loss statements, understanding what that looks like, and then all the way down to the individual tax return so that we understand the flow of the money, the income generated in the business, yeah. um, so that we can again put the client in the best possible light to achieve their borrowing capacity. Yeah. Um, we typically, with self-employed, want to see two years of financials. Um, not all banks want two years, but for us, we want consistency to see how strong is the, is the business. Um, you know, and it could be a startup, so the first year might not be as strong as the second. Um, but again, it's about thorough conversation for yeah, us absolutely. to understand. And definitely, you know, there is um, definitely scope for borrowers that have only had one year of business or yep. only have one year of business financials to provide uh, for the application. But yep. it is good to, you know, I guess we're on we're on your we're on your team. Yep. So the more information you can give us as your mortgage brokers, the better placed we are to help find the right lender uh, yep. and the right product that's gonna meet your needs. Yep. Um, so that's really good. So that's in relation to the financials and they need to be account and prepared of course. They do. And I guess, you know, there are some other things that can help. For example, if you're, you know, if you've had a, if you're having a really strong financial year in the current financial year yep. and, you know, we need the bank to, um, we need a little bit more to get it over the line. You know, sometimes the bank will accept, you know, your most up-to-date BAS statements yep. as an indication that your, you know, your revenues are going to be consistent or yep. improvement of last year. For so sure. there's a lot of things that we can do to, help you to uh, get the income level that you need to represent to get the uh, application approved. Definitely. But we did have an interesting question from Sam. Yep. Sam wanted to know um, of other self-employed income verification options outside yeah. of, um, I guess, 
accountant prepared financials? Yeah, definitely. So we've, we've had, um, we have cases where, um, as you mentioned earlier, that there are BAS statements that can help us with that future projection of income. Um, we could also look at um, the business trading statements, so maybe- Bank um, account statements. Yeah, within you know maybe a six to 12 month period to show um, what the actual transactions are like from an income perspective. Um, and we can also get a letter from the accountant declaring the income of the business. Um, it's not as common as maybe once was, but what we are seeking from, from these things is, like you said earlier, a verification of where is this business going in the future? Yeah. Um, and, it, and I suppose uh, supporting an application saying, yes, it is a strong business, um, we're performing well and growing, um, and those things do help us get um, the banks on side to approve deals. Excellent. So I think we've pretty much covered income. Yep. Are you comfortable with that, happy with Richard? That. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Hopefully that answers your question, Sam. I think it is a case by case basis. So definitely. definitely come and speak to to us, and we can go through it in more details. Yeah. So the next thing that we talked about was liabilities, yep. and liabilities was uh, obviously yep. any debts that you have or yep. any ongoing financial commitments yep. or obligations. So. Um, Fran asked an interesting question about this, but firstly, before I get into Fran's question, let's just talk about, you know, what sort of liabilities we would need to declare to the bank and yep. what we would need to provide them with in order to verify those liabilities. Yeah, so to keep it simple, we need to declare all of them. <laughs> um, and it's always better that we uh, declare them up front than, than, uh, than them finding out about them. And they will find without out. Us, without us telling them, because they will find out, yep. especially now with open banking. You know, yep. you can't really hide liabilities from the bank. So yep. it's really important to be up front with them. Definitely. So what, what, what I want to see is your credit card statements. I want to know um, what limits there, there are and how much you are, uh, is outstanding on those. I want to see personal loans or car loans. Um, again, what are the repayments? What are the what's the amount owing? I want to see um, any lease agreements or um, even if you are salary sacrificing for a car. A lot of the time, um, clients may not understand if they go through a leasing agency that there is actually a financier behind that. Mm. So we want to see those contracts as well. Yeah. Um, Even things like hex debt. Uh, hex debt, a hundred percent. Yep. So there are thresholds personal on personal loans. Yeah, um, personal loans, hex debts, store cards, the whole lot, after pay, <laughs> <laughs> zip money, anything that you have entered into a payment arrangement with. Yeah. I want to know about it. Um, the ones that people often forget is the um, interest-free purchases. Yeah. You know, just um, even that that people don't realise that they're actually entering into a. A credit agreement. Yeah, a credit yeah. agreement when they're um, getting some, you know, buying some furniture on interest-free arrangement. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we, we just want to see it all to make sure that when we're providing advice mm. um, or, or lending options to to our clients that we've factored absolutely everything in. Yeah. Because if you come to us after that with an extra credit card, that may make or break the deal. So we want to do the checking at the start. That's right. So that we can give very, very good um, lending options and also mm. be confident we're gonna get an approval, which ultimately the client wants. Exactly, um, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, preparation is the key and making sure that we are across everything because definitely. there's always, you know, there's always a solution, but it's really important to be armed with all the information up front. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, just wanna shout out to James, Annette, Katie and Susan. Thanks so much for joining in guys. We hope that you're enjoying the session. Please feel free to comment below um, or ask any questions in the comments and definitely. we will definitely address them during the session. Absolutely. So that pretty much, oh no, I was going to ask Living you Fran's expenses. question. Yep. No, we had Fran who okay. asked a question about liabilities. So she, Fran wanted to know why does she have to provide her bank statements for loan accounts that she's not refinancing? Yes. So that's a good question yep. because you know you sort of think, well, if you're not refinancing the loan, why should you have to provide the bank statements for them? Yep. Um, what would you say for, to Fran? I think the most important thing for providing those um, is to make sure the conduct is good, to mm. make sure that you're meeting each of the repayments on time because any indication maybe with those accounts that you're not on time with your payments or you know, um, you've missed a couple would potentially show the new bank that um, maybe there's been some 
short-term hardship or there's been um, uh, an overextension of your cash. Yeah. Um, and we would just want to make sure that, um, again, we would review all of that. Yeah, but the bank wants to see we... it because they want that hard evidence being the statement to effectively be the facts that you're making your payments on time. Yeah. Um, and, and it also helps us to verify the amount that you owe and the interest rate that you're paying and what the repayments are. And that's all helpful information. Definitely. Um, but going back to your point in relation to the account conduct, you know, that's more important now than it ever has been. It has, yeah. You know, with positive credit reporting, if you tuned into our episode about that, um, if not, make sure you go and watch yep. it. Uh, but about positive credit reporting, now if you're two weeks late for a repayment, that's been marked on your report. Yeah. And um, it is really damaging your credit rating moving forward, which will impact your ability to get access to well-priced yep. finance. Yep. So that's, you know, these sorts of things are important for us to understand before yep. we submit a loan application, so. Yeah, definitely. I think we're spending more and more time now looking at what you've done in the last two, three, four, right up to six months in your transactions um, to make sure that it's suitable then for the loan moving forward. Absolutely. So it's, um, yeah. you know, I suppose it's looking back to gain an indication of what your habits are like, providing that to the bank because they'll look at that and say, well, this is what you're going to be like moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and what we do know that uh, when you do buy a home or when you when you enter into a, a mortgage like, like, like a home loan, of course, mm. um, that you typically do make lifestyle changes too to make sure you're meeting those repayments. Um, but what we're seeing now is we're, we're best to have for a first home buyer, a lead in of maybe three to four months so that we can start to coach around um, what the account conduct looks like. Are we overspending? Um, are we holding Helping genuine- Helping them with their yeah, savings 100%, plan. hundred percent, genuine to... savings, all these little things yeah. um, to, I suppose, put a picture in place of the consistency of the new applicant. Yeah, so is um, that what you would do with say a first home buyer or say, you know, someone that wants to upgrade their house, yep. um, you know, what sort of coaching would you be providing them in the lead up to their application? Well, I think first of all, we would go through, um, you know, our fact finding process, which goes through the living expense categories. Yeah. And in those categories, we're pretty comprehensive. So we've got about 13 or 14 categories that we go through from uh, rates and utilities, groceries, telephone, you know, so it's um, kind of a good budgeting process. Very good for, budgeting process. I mean, process. it's a good awareness process yep. for the applicant as well. Yeah. Um, just to really actually sit down and, and yep. find out, well, how much are they spending in every yep. area of their life? And potentially they might be able to identify from that process, you know, some potential room for improvement yep. with how they manage their money or yep. how much of it they're keeping. Yeah. Um, do you find that is a really sort of enlightening process for most yeah, applicants? It is. Yeah. And, and, and I think a lot of the time, you do know that you're either overspending or, or you're very good with your money. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a secret, but I suppose bringing it to the table, writing the numbers out and having a look, it then says, right, well, there's areas to improve. If I'm spending too much on recreation entertainment, if I'm going out for tea three or four nights a week instead of maybe cooking twice out of those two to, to reduce my monthly living expenses, there are many ways we can look at attacking the living expenses as they are. And I guess we, we are actually getting a bit off track. Yeah, we'll we bring it back to, the, yeah, yeah. back to track in a minute. But I think it's really um, interesting to just emphasize this point that, you know, we provide a non threatening, non judgmental, yeah. um, I guess, you know, environment yeah. to really go through those things. Definitely. And, you know, I guess I just bring it back to the fact that we're working for you. Yeah. So we want the best outcome for you. Um, and being able to go through this process with you yep. not only will help you in your sort of future money management spending and planning, but also help you to just achieve what you want to achieve with, with the you know, end goal. Definitely. I think to reiterate that point, we, you've come, potentially you've reached out to us wanting to achieve the goal of home ownership or to potentially save on interest rates or whatever that is. So. Um, there is, a, you know, there's no greater pleasure, I suppose, than actually helping you achieve that. And if to get there, you need to manage your money better, then that's the first step we need to take. Um, if your conduct isn't too good, then we need to look at how we're going to, how are we going to improve that. 
because ultimately if we put an application forward um, and things aren't looking good then the client will either pay a lot higher in interest than the market is currently advertising or they'll get a decline therefore not achieving their goal so yeah. you know and, you take the, and taking that the also time, impacts their credit rating as well so yeah, 100%. also not good so yeah it's really good to have all the information up front so we I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us back on back topic on now. <laughs> so we did yep. talk about we've talked about identification, we've talked about liabilities. Yep. Um, we were gonna talk about assets next, but we skipped that. We went straight on to living expenses. Yep. So. Um, <laughs> so I'll just actually finish the topic of living expenses before we move on to assets, okay. if that's okay. Yep. Because Ben did have a good question. Um, ben asked, he said, my bank has asked me to detail all my living expenses, but yep. I don't really know what they are and how to break them down by category. Do I need to complete this form? So, uh -huh. you know, a lot of people probably share Ben's frustration yep. that, you know, the reality is a lot of people aren't keeping tabs on exactly what their living expenses are in each category yep. of living. So what sort of advice would you give to Ben in rela relation to this? Yeah, we did touch on yeah, the categories, etc. But what, what I would um, add on to that is... Um, to, to have a look at your own bank statements and just mm. start to fill in the categories. It's a worthwhile exercise and, and in reality, it shouldn't take more than 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And it's also something that we can help with. Yep. Uh, we do have access to a really good uh, program that does allow us to analyze your past six months bank statements. Yep. And that is something that we can prepare for you yep. and present it to you so that it almost does a lot of the work for you in Definitely. terms of breaking your experience expenditure down by category yeah so that's definitely something that we can help with as well yeah and the categories are important because if we just group it all in one then how do we know that you know maybe eight hundred dollars of that it's not just going towards food or um, you know and then mm. so, so it's a, it's really key to break it down to show where the money's been allocated um, but I suppose there are tools online as well um, on our on our website. I always drive people to jump on and use our our tools. So we've got the good um, living expense template in there, which I personally use um, because effectively I want to be practicing what I'm preaching. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I jump in there and muck around with it a lot and realize for me my big big expense, although small each transaction is coffee. So yeah. um, I look at that and make and make sure that, hey, I haven't gone too overboard um, each week on, on my coffee. But, um, you know, it is also liberating. Once you've done it, you realise, oh, yeah, I have been leaking a bit of money out to fast food or to Uber mm. Eats or and that And that that's mean. definitely, I think living expenses at the moment is definitely the number one thing it is. that would be holding a lot of people back from borrowing the money they want to yep. borrow or achieving what they want to achieve because... Banks are getting much stricter on living yep. expenses and really wanting the living expenses that are declared in the application to reflect, you know, the past six months of spending. Definitely. Um, you know, so that, but but saying that, you know, a yep. lot of banks are taking the view that there are some discretionary spend Definitely. items yep. where you have been spending that money historically, but they are you know, you are able to choose not to continue spending that money moving forward. Yep. And that's the process that we would go through with you to, um, you know, work out what of, you know, which of your expenses were fixed expenses and not negotiable versus which ones are discretionary. And you do have the ability to maybe adjust your spending if required to yep. meet your mortgage repayment. So yep. this is the process that we have to go through together to then make sure that we're putting your best foot forward when we put the loan application in. Absolutely. Yep. So, have we covered living expenses? I think, we have, I think yes. we've covered Ben's question. So, Ben, just come to us. We'll help you get a download of your past six months and get it categorized for you. Yeah. So, that's Ben's question. So, I'm going to go back to assets yep. now. So, we've done identification, we've done liabilities, we've done living expenses. So, now we're on to assets. Yep. So, um, what do we need to show the bank as far as assets are concerned? Yeah. So, to maybe take one quick step back and then move into assets. So, we've covered off. Um, living expenses, so that's the, the money going out. Assets, when we present assets to a bank, it's showing the lender you've also been able to um, accumulate some uh, positive things within your life, like, like, a, like a home or a car, maybe some savings and superannuation. Yep. So yep. They're, they're typically the assets that we, we look to group. 
Um, because and that then can often help, you know, showing showing the assets that you've been able to accumulate can often help with your credit rating as well. Definitely. Because it shows that you've been using your money in an effective way during your lifespan. Definitely. So um, as I mentioned, there are a few categories we like to tick off and that's vehicles. Um, and that could also be motorbikes or caravans, um, boats, those sorts of things that have got yeah. good monetary value. Um, your contents. Investment properties. Investment properties. Um, also looking at shares if you've got, you know, um, if you've got money invested into shares. So it's good to boost those things up, you know, just to show the bank that you have been, you know, you're putting your money to good use. Yeah, they're categories we take seriously. Like, as you mentioned, mm. um, it helps strengthen up an application and shows the bank that you're not just spending money, you're also putting or well, spending money on, on um, non-discretionary things, yeah. you're, you're moving money into into assets as and well. And I guess, you know, that raises a good point because we just mentioned investment properties, obviously a good asset yeah. and a lot of people, you know, have an investment property or aspire to have an investment property. Yeah. Obviously with the investment property, um, it's not just the asset that's important, but it's also the rental income that's coming in from that property. Definitely. So, you know, that's something that we could um, get maybe a property management statement yep. or you know, some sort of lease agreement to show what rental income you're getting because we can also use that income yeah. towards the application too. Definitely, and that, and that probably goes back into a income side of things. There are more incomes than just PAYG and self-employed. Mm. We can use, of course, rental income, centering in income as well um, that we can use. And there are a few different types of income uh, that are not your traditional types that we can look at as well. Yep. So. Um, yeah, so that, that I think that covers assets. Um, it's really just the the stuff that you've accumulated, or the, the the strength that you've accumulated over a period of time. Cars, property, super shares, and cash savings. Yep, great. Okay, so we've covered liabilities. Yep. We've covered assets. We've covered living expenses. So. I'm going to move into exit strategy because we had a really good question okay. from Jim. Yep. Um, Jim said he's 40 years old and he wants to refinance his home loan, but the bank is asking me for my exit strategy. Okay. Uh, what is an exit strategy and what do I need to provide to address this question? This is a good question, Jim, this because is a great uh, let's firstly explain what exit strategy yep. means and why Jim at the age of 40 might need to come up with an exit strategy. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, an exit strategy is, um, I suppose, the bank asking the new client how they're going to pay this mortgage um, once they start entering into maybe the retirement age bracket. So the bank effectively wants to know that your debt is going to be paid off in full before you retire. Yes. How do we provide an exit strategy or how do we um, supplement or, or I suppose um, paint a decent picture to the bank that you have a strong exit strategy? Um, there are a number of uh, ways to do that. Um, depending on the bank, they want to see different criteria. So 40 is quite young, um, but if you're looking to enter into a 30-year loan term, mm. you're going to get... That means you'll be 70 when the loan... You're into that bracket now, which um, you know I suppose is within retirement age. Yeah. So we can then look at if you've got investment properties, mm -hmm. okay. So if you have, so could that could, that could be considered an exit strategy? Uh, yep, definitely. Potentially, so, yep. selling an investment property could be an exit strategy. Yeah, because then it's not impacting your principal place of residence, and it mm. could have some equity within it to help reduce the debt that you currently hold on your yep. owner-occupied property. What about superannuation? Superannuation is another could one. Contribute to your exit strategy yep, as well. Definitely. Um, and also we can be looking at, um, so we talk, talked about investment property, so we talked about um, superannuation. Um, if you've got large sums of, of cash as well, yep. that's another- or shares or sh potentially. Yep. And shares. So effectively we're looking for ways that you can pay down the lump sum of the loan that's yep. remaining at a point in time when you stop working. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, 40 years young for the bank to be <laughs> asking you about your exit strategy. Yep. Um, and you know, certainly if you're working with us, they probably wouldn't, so we suggest you come and have a chat with us about it. But um, generally speaking, you know, I guess if, if you are going to be going into, you know, the 65 plus age bracket by the time your loan 
expires, yep. your loan term expires, then we need to be thinking of how we're going to address exit strategy with the lenders. Because most yep. lenders are asking for that now. They are. And yep. wanting to know that we've at least addressed it um, and that the clients are understanding and the borrowers understanding yep. how they're gonna pay off this debt once they reach um, that phase of their life, which yeah. is retirement. Definitely, and, and we can also um, potentially look at speeding up the payment process on, on the debt as well. So whether you pay weekly or fortnightly or, or look to um, you know, make additional payments over and above the minimum to speed up what would be a 30 year loan term to maybe bring it down to um, a shorter payout yeah, time. Yeah, that's definitely well. one of the options yeah. or looking at, you know, and different banks have different policies regarding exit strategies. So if a longer loan term is important to you and you are a little bit older, um, you're in your 50s or you know even in your 60s and you do want that longer loan term yep. then there are definitely lenders that will be more flexible with you than other lenders so that's yep. you know that's an important consideration to have in mind when you're coming yeah. to us about that so Absolutely. hopefully that answers Jim's question yep. um, so let's just summarize because yep. we've talked about identification needing a hundred points of ID we've talked about income which we've talked about PAYG, yep. self-employed, rental income. We've talked about liabilities. Yeah. We've talked about assets, um, you know, showing what you've been able to accomplish with your assets. Yeah. We've talked in depth about living expenses. We have, um, yeah. And that's a really important point. Yeah. And we've also talked about exit strategy. So I think, you know, we've pretty much covered, we have. covered what we wanted to go through today. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add, Richard? No, I, I think, um, I know we talked about maybe covering it off uh, in a little bit more detail. It's quite um, basic information, um, but it does paint a big picture. So for us, we will ask the questions. We want to potentially ask um, a second round of questions to go deeper into these things so that when we do, again, provide the or put the application forward to the bank, we want to be ultra confident of an approval. So when we are gathering this information up front, we, we're putting a lot of time and emphasis into it, um, but it uh, obviously in the end is huge re reward once you've got your, your new loan in place. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything more to add. I think we've-, yeah. we've um, awesome. Well, hopefully that's given you enough information to just understand what sort of information you need to provide when yep. you're submitting a loan application and the sorts of things that the banks are looking for when they're looking at reviewing your loan application. Um, but we're always here to help, so please get in touch with us if there's anything we can do to help you or any questions that you have that we haven't addressed on this um, video. We'd love to talk to you about it. And just a quick reminder to, if you are a first home buyer, register for our seminar on the 19th of September. It is free and full of great information. Um, so that's going to be located in Prospect at our office. And we're also holding a seminar for property investors on the 17th of October, which we also encourage you to come along to if you're interested in investing. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us to the end of today's segment. Once again, thank you so much to all of our clients that made it possible for us to win the National Australian Mortgage Broking Business of the Year Award yeah. at the recent Mortgage and Finance Association Awards. We are very grateful for your support and loyalty. And thanks to Richard for- No worries. Um, joining me today and we'll see you next time on Rise High TV. Bye. Thank you. See ya.